Let's pray. Father, throughout all these services, we have been listening to you, and now some of us are gathered here Saturday evening, some are gathered Sunday night, some are gathered Sunday morning, and you are here, and we are eager to hear from you, from your inspired word concerning the risen Christ. So come and help me be faithful to your word. In Jesus' name I ask, amen. The Bible has two parts. You know this probably. It has an Old Testament and a New Testament. And in the New Testament, there are 27 books. Four of them are called Gospels that tell the story of Jesus. 21 of them are letters that unpack the meaning of Jesus for the church and our individual lives and the world, and one is a history book about the early church, and one is a prophecy called Revelation, and every one of those 27 books deal with Jesus Christ as a resurrected, risen, living person who is the centerpiece of the universe, all of them deal with Jesus that way. And what I want to do is watch with you Jesus, risen from the grave, appear for the first time to his disciples or his apostles, sometimes they're called, the 11. Judas is gone now and hanged himself. And there are 11 and they're hiding and they're frightened and He's just appeared to Mary in the morning, Mary Magdalene, and now he will come to these frightened men. And I want to go with you to that scene and see what he does and see what he says. Those are my two focuses. What will he do and what will he say? So that's where we're going. And uh, inside the front flap of your worship folder is the text and it's also in John 20, 19 to 23. So let's go to verse 19. Don't have the verses numbered there inside the flap, but you can probably find your way around. On the evening, so we're focusing now on what he did. What did he do? And the reason I, I'm looking at what he did and what he said is because I think that the way John is telling this, he means for us in the 21st century to look at this way of acting as the way he acts towards us now. And the way he talks as decisive about the things he says to us now. He's alive, he's just as alive today as he was then. So what is he like? And how does he relate to us? And what does he say today? And I think we can read that off of this first encounter. So here we are, verse 19, John 20. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, so that's Sunday, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them. So, he was crucified on Friday. He's been in the grave bodily for a part of three days. And now he has risen early in the morning. He has appeared to Mary. You read about that in the first 18 verses of chapter 20. And now he's coming and he's appearing to the disciples. And I want to point out three things that are true about this, and they relate to what he does. One, the doors are locked or shut. Two, they're very frightened. And three, Jesus comes and stands in their midst. Those are three facts I want to ponder with you for a moment. Number one, the doors were locked, and Jesus didn't have to knock and he didn't have to open the door. He was simply there in their midst 
and he wasn't a ghost. Verse 20, he showed them his hands and his side where the spear went in. In another place over in the Gospel of Luke, it says, touch me and see, a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. They, they were afraid they're just seeing things. They were afraid this is just a ghost. How did he come in here anyway? And, and he went on, according to Luke, and he said, do you have anything to eat? And they gave him a piece of fish and he ate it. All of that just to prove I'm not a ghost. I have flesh, I have bones, I have a hole in my side. He's physical and yet not quite like us. They could tell it was him, he, so he had the same visage, and yet the door is shut and he's just there. So he's like us and yet he's not like us. He has a body, it's not quite like our body, yet it is like our body, and that's a picture of the way it's going to be in the resurrection, a picture of the new heavens and the new earth where we will dwell when we are raised from the dead. It won't be just exactly like us, but it will be enough like us that everything good that we've loved about this creation will go with us, and yet everything bad and limiting gets left behind. I think what this means for you today, me today, is that Jesus can go in our lives where nobody else can go. He can go where your counselor cannot go. He can go where the doctor cannot go, and he can go where lovers cannot go. He can reach you. He can reach into you anywhere, anytime, and there's no place where you are, and there's no depth of personhood that you are that Jesus can't penetrate. There is no one like him in this regard in all the universe. He's alive and is the God-man and he's capable of things you cannot imagine. It's a healing wonder, at least I feel it this way. It's a healing wonder to contemplate that all the complex layers of your life that you don't understand and nobody understands are familiar territory to the risen Christ. I find that to be incredibly stabilizing in my utterly perplexing self. Second, they were afraid. Verse 19 again, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews. Their leader three days ago had just been crucified as a threat to the crown to Caesar. These folks are in great danger, they know it, and they're afraid, and it's totally understandable. And into that fear, Jesus comes, he comes, he stands into that fear. Now, I suppose the reason I want to draw your attention to this personally is because um, fear is the place in my life where Jesus makes himself powerfully known most often. Don't know if I'm like you in this regard. Fear that I won't be prepared for what I'm expected to do. I have to speak in Louisville to an arena full of people on Thursday. My sermon's not ready. I don't know when it's going to happen. I, this happens to me all the time. So there's this knot in my stomach. Like these guys are expecting me to say something and I don't know what I'm going to say yet. Fear that the church won't prosper. Fear that a conference won't be attended. Fear that a class won't be helpful to, to the students. Fear that my children are going to make shipwreck 
of their lives. Fear that I won't have the faith to die well. Fear that I might drift into worldliness and uselessness as a pastor. And what Jesus is saying in this action is, I come to my own when they're afraid to help them. Notice, he, he doesn't stand outside saying, look, the Bible has said a hundred times, fear not. When you get your act together and believe God enough to fear not, I'll come. He doesn't talk that way. The risen Christ sees me struggling to be not afraid. He sees me trying to be not afraid. He sees me saying, I believe, help my unbelief. And he comes. He comes right into the midst of our fear. Our favorite fighter verse, like, when I am afraid, I trust in you. Not, not after or before or when, but when I am afraid. I suppose I have cried out a thousand times. I tried to do some math, but gave up. Just let's round it off really low. I suppose I have cr cried a thousand times, help me, just before doing something that I'm afraid I may not do well. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will help you, I will strengthen you, I will hold you up with my victorious right hand. He has spoken into my trembling soul a thousand times as the risen, present, near, caring Christ, not the distant Christ. So they were afraid and he stood in their midst is not without point. Third, Jesus comes to them and stands in their midst. Verse 19 again, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them. He stood there in the middle of the meeting. He didn't come to the edge. He didn't whisper through the wall. He's not a distant deity. He's not playing games. He's not toying with their faith. He wanted them to see him. He wanted them to know him. He's trying to help them believe. I mean, later he's going to say to Thomas, do you, do you believe because you see? Blessed are those who haven't seen and yet believe. And yet he didn't stay back. He didn't toy with them. He said, I'm going to see if you believe. Woohoo! can you recognize my voice? He didn't do that. He, he came right there. He said, look at this. This is really helpful to them. And he doesn't mean for you to be without help. And you may say, well, I can't see him. No, you can't. He's got another way for us to know. He's got other ways to get at you. That's why you're here. He is alive and he is not helpless to help you see. With the eyes of your heart. He will help you. He didn't stay at a distance. He came to them and he wants us today. He wants us to believe and to trust and to hope and to know him and to see him. And that's what I want for you in this service. So that's the way he acted. Let's shift gears. What did he say? No. This gets even better. What did he say? He said three things, maybe four, depending on how you count them. Um, and, and when you analyze these three things that he said to them, you see that he's giving them a gift, three of them. The gift of peace, a gift of power, and a gift of purpose. And the more I have thought about those three things, it really is the sum of life. Can you build your life on peace with God and peace with yourself and peace with others? Can you have the power to do what you need to do in life? And can you have a purpose that really satisfies from beginning to end and takes you into eternity knowing you've spent your life well? That's what this is about. This is huge. This is really huge. 
I can't think of anything that's missing from all of that if you understand it as fully as Jesus is offering it. You know, I try to think, the opposite of peace is conflict. The opposite of power is weakness. The opposite of purpose is aimlessness. And a lot of lives are destroyed through conflict and weakness and aimlessness. And Jesus didn't come into the world to destroy you. The Bible says that real plain, John in particular. I did not come to judge and destroy and ruin lives. I came to bring a kind of peace and a kind of power and a kind of purpose so that lives wouldn't be ruined and I could rescue them from the ruin they're making of themselves through lack of peace and lack of power and lack of purpose and I want them to know this. So that's what I hope you've got your ears up for now. What did he say? Number one, he said, peace be with you. Let's read verses 19 and 20. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. When, they, when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. And then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. And Jesus said to them, Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. So he says it twice, peace to you, peace be with you. And the order here is massively important. Before you think about doing anything with power or accomplishing anything with purpose, you've got to have peace with God because otherwise you're going to think about those doings with power and accomplishings with purpose as the way you get peace which is the opposite of the Christian religion. Other religions go about it that way. Got to do some stuff for God. Got to have some power. Got to have some purpose in life. Got to make a few things happen. Then maybe, maybe I'll reach some peace. God's not impressed with that religiosity. Jesus comes first to these people who abandon him a few hours before, they abandoned him. They have every reason to believe he's coming with a whip to scold them. They have every reason to believe the relationship is broken, it's ruined, Peter especially. And instead, the first thing out of his mouth is peace. That must have landed on them as sweet as the words Today you'll be with me in paradise landed on the thief on the cross. <laughs> you know, just getting two sweeter words to be a man on death row. Hear the words, today you'll be with me in paradise. And, and then to hear these disciples have them hear, I'm coming in peace to you. Just think of all the things you've done. You think maybe he's coming in peace to you? Well, he is because I'm representing him here and that's the way he's come. He says so. Now, the Apostle Paul gives us a little insight here. He wrote one of those 21 letters. <laughs> he wrote 13 of them. And uh, in this one, he says, Jesus himself is our peace, who has made us both, meaning Jew and Gentile, people in Christ, made us both one and reconciled us both to God in one body through the cross thereby killing the hostility. That's an amazing and very important sentence. So the peace Christ is offering these disciples was accomplished on the cross. Through the cross, I'm making peace vertically with God so that hostility there is taken away. I've absorbed his hostility on the cross, and I'm calling you to lay down yours and enjoy that. And I'm taking away the hostility between you and others that are being reconciled to God. And then in verse 20, when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. In other words, I am the one who died. I'm the one you abandoned. I'm the one who was pierced 
pierced for your transgressions, like Isaiah said, and the reason I can offer you peace is because your sins against me and against my Father are covered by my blood. That's why I can offer you peace. If you trust me, your sins won't be held against you, and the wrath of God is turned away by my cross. Here's Paul's words again. Christ reconciled us both to God through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. Now, there are five relationships, and you've probably thought of maybe three of these so far, five relationships where he brings peace to us. So right now, in this room, by his spirit, by his word, he is offering peace in five ways. Here they are. Number one, peace between us and him. That's the first and most obvious meaning. I come into this room and I'm giving peace to you because I'm saying it, peace to you, me and you. I'm the one you just abandoned, Peter. You just denied me. I'm offering peace to you. And so it's peace between us and Jesus. Second, peace between us and God the Father. God's justice demands punishment. Jesus was sent by the Father to bear the punishment and complete the righteousness that we needed to get and we couldn't perform, and therefore now the Father is satisfied, and He comes to us as an adopting, loving, caring, folding in Father, running down the street to welcome prodigals who on Easter go to church and get met by God saying, yes, come on in. This is where I want you to be with me. Third, peace between us and others who are in Christ. He he makes peace vertically, and in making peace vertically in one way for very different people, these people can't have hostility anymore. Tulsa, Sanford. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no more male or female. There is one in Christ Jesus. Number four, peace between us and our own souls. Another place in the Bible, book of Hebrews, it says, the the blood of Christ will purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Is is there anything more sweet than a clean, clear, non-condemning conscience? And anything more horribly troublesome night after night, day after day, than a voice in your heart saying, you do wrong, you do wrong, you do wrong, you do wrong. You'll never make it. You'll never go to heaven. You deserve wrath. You are wrong, 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 wrong. A voice that's just crying out and, and, and it's telling the truth. It's you know how to live with it. And when Jesus offered them peace, according to Hebrews, the blood of Christ purifies our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. I read uh, a testimony of a woman who had an abortion eight years ago this week, and she said, I cannot forgive myself. And I wrote, that's what Good Friday is for. Peace with yourself doesn't mean that you start seeing past sins as desirable. Oh, now I can be peaceful because they're not as sinful as I thought they were. That's not the way it happens. Peace doesn't mean past sins cease to be painful. It means they cease to be paralyzing. The pain may not be taken away immediately, but the penalty is taken away immediately in Christ. When you believe in Jesus and accept his peace, the penalty of every sin is gone. It's over. It was on Jesus. No condemnation. The pain may remain, but but here's the beauty of it. When 
the penalty is removed, the paralysis is broken, and you are enabled to move forward with life while this pain gradually gets healed. That's what's possible when the penalty and the paralysis are taken away by the cross. So he gives us peace with ourselves. And lastly, he gives us peace in the world. We just heard that reading, maybe not all of us watching this video, but in this service, an amazing reading of the absence of peace in the world. And I just want to make sure that we don't um, turn Jesus into an individualistic little pietist who just goes from person to person, make little private pockets of peace indifferent to this planet. He's the Lord of lords and King of kings. And when he died, according to Colossians 1 and many texts in the Old Testament, this was purchased. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. There's going to be a new heavens and a new earth and all the horrors of Mali or a hundred soldiers in Pakistan just swept away in one avalanche or three friends shot dead in Tulsa or, 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 or. That is going to be over. And Jesus did that with his blood. He bought the new earth. He bought the new heavens. And we're working toward that. And then he will break into history in due time and make it happen just like that. Peace with Jesus. Peace with the Father. Peace with others in Christ. Peace with ourselves. And peace with the world. That is an amazing achievement. And the way you receive it is by faith. It's a gift. It's a gift. You don't earn it. You don't do anything to get it. You simply receive it as a gift. To all who received him, to them gave he power to become the children of God. Since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God. Just Faith, I believe you, I trust you, I receive you. This is true about you and now in my receiving about me. This is my life now. That's what faith says. Now, I've spoken almost the entire time on peace. Intentionally. I didn't, it didn't sneak up on me. I know how long I have here. We're doing fine. So very briefly, I want to say a word about power now and about purpose and show you where I see that in the text. And the reason I spent the time I did on peace is because I am so totally persuaded from the Bible that if you get that right, if you're standing there with that kind of fivefold peace, the things you're called to do purposefully and powerfully in the world, they're going to take their place. But if you get that wrong, all the power and all the purpose in the world will do you no good and will do people much harm. So, verse 21, Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And then... And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. Now we know from other parts of the Bible that Jesus was going to rise into heaven about seven weeks after he was raised from the dead. He ascends bodily into heaven where he is today in his risen body take up his place at the right hand of the Father where he intercedes for us and then pour out the Holy Spirit ten days later at Pentecost. And he tells us why he was going to pour out the Holy Spirit and bless the church with the habitation of the Holy Spirit in us. And he puts it like this in Acts chapter 1. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. 
The Holy Spirit is given to those who believe in Christ as the presence of the risen Christ, powerfully enabling them to do things that we can't do on our own, things that are important to do, like believe on Jesus and love each other and lay our lives down for just causes in the world. Those are unnatural to selfish humans. And the only way I can have the power to love unlovely people, to subdue and put to death my own sinful, selfish impulses, to spend myself at some cost for some good, worthy, Christ-exalting cause in the world, how could I, sinful, selfish, fallible John Piper, do that? One answer, God gave the Holy Spirit who dwells in me and in all those who trust him as the power for living a life of love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, meekness, faithfulness, and self-control, the fruit of the Spirit. It takes supernatural power for people like us to gradually become people like that. So what's happening here in verse 22 is, I believe, an acted-out parable. Like, what's going on here? breathing. He breathed on them. And then he said, receive the Holy Spirit. He didn't say receive it at this instant. He said, receive it. And I think signifying my breath, my life, my word will come to you in the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit comes to you, I'm breathing life into you. When the Holy Spirit comes to you, I'm breathing power into you. When the Holy Spirit comes to you, I'm giving you my word. That's the parable that he's acting out here. And we saw it in chapter 14 two weeks ago, just like that. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Meaning, when the Holy Spirit comes, I am coming. His breath will be my breath when he comes. So this person, this power is our only hope for accomplishing now, secondly, thirdly, the purpose of verse 21, second half of the verse. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. I want you to live in the world now. You, you, you Christians who have my peace, who have my power, I want you to live in the world as I lived in the world. I want you to be my ambassadors. I want you to be my representatives. I'm the light of the world. Now you be the light of the world. Let your light so shine that may see your good deeds. I was sent as the light. I'm sending you as light in this dark world. He sent me as truth. I'm sending you as truth. He sent me as a witness. I'm sending you as a witness. He sent me to love. I'm sending you to love. I'm sending you to do what I said in chapter 12, verse 27, was my main reason for being here. Father, shall you deliver me from this hour? No, for this hour I have come. Glorify your name. Jesus came into the world to make God look great, to make him look like he really is in a peace-giving, power-giving, loving, caring, forgiving, receiving God. As the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. So Jesus comes and gives them peace, he gives them power, and he gives them a purpose for their lives that is summed up in represent me well. Make much of me in all your vocations. I'm not asking you to change jobs. God doesn't care much what you do for a job as long as you represent him there and don't do sin. In fact, he wants us in our jobs like scattered salt all over the world in every kind of sphere. Just be me there. Show me there. And that's your purpose for living. So I'm sending you to extend my peace and... uh, Go in my power and do my purpose. Now, if you're puzzled in closing with verse 23, a lot of people are. If 
you forgive, now he's talking to the disciples, or to me now, say, speaking to you, if you, John Piper, forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. What does that mean? Here's what I think it means. Piper, representatives of me, when you tell people what I have done, like you've done for the last 35 minutes, when you tell people what I have done, when you do this in my power and speak my word, it is me speaking through you. And I'm the one who has the power to forgive sins. And therefore, if they receive what you have spoken about me and in my name and by my power, they will receive me and they will be forgiven. And if they reject what you say in my name by my power, then they reject me and they reject forgiveness. But I am telling you, John Piper, if you're faithful to my word, if you speak what I have spoken, if you do it in the power of my spirit, you are speaking and I tell you, you are binding their sin or loosing their sin by the gospel you are preaching. Which means, as I end, it does come down to that, doesn't it? That's why you're here. If I have spoken faithfully, if I have represented the risen Christ faithfully according to God's word, what you do with what I have said will make the difference between whether your sins are forgiven and you have peace or whether your sins are not forgiven and you remain in conflict with God. And neither God nor I would want that to happen. And so I close by pleading with you, just like Paul did, as an ambassador of Christ, I beseech you, I urge you, I entreat you, be reconciled to God. He has removed the hostility at the cross from his side for all those who are his. And if you would be part of that, the wrath is removed from you. And if you say, no, I won't have it, the wrath will remain on you and your sins will abide. And I don't want that. And he doesn't. So whether you're watching this on the video or whether you're here in this room, I plead with you, deal with God and receive what Jesus offered, peace, power and purpose for this life. And there'll be a time after the service where we can pray about that. Let's pray. So, Father, as we close this service in a great surge of worship, I pray that you would come and win faith from every person in these rooms. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.